Kitty, uh, Maggie, Jen, thanks very, very much indeed for uh, inviting me here on the launch of what I have to say, I really, I mean, I haven't read every page of it, but I, I know enough about this report to recognise in it, I think, uh, in the flurry of reports that are produced by think tanks, something which is, I, I think, um, of lasting significance. It touches on a whole range of social policy dilemmas, economic policy dilemmas. Uh, it touches on cultural and social stereotypes and prejudices which need to be confounded. But I have to say what I, what I really like about it, I think it's probably partly borne out by the methodology used, the sort of ethnographic, I say this as a former social anthropology undergraduate, is, uh, is, is that there's something very human about it. There's something really very human about it. It's, it's kind of rooted in the in the practical day-to-day -day texture of, 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 of families' lives. And I think that really springs out from the report. I love the, I love the front cover. It's time to be honest about what good parenting involves. As a parent who got duped by my nine-year-old into organising a sleepover, in fact, the most sleepless sleepover <laughs> ever uh, this weekend, I would say one of the things that it involves uh, is, uh, is not much sleep. But anyway, um, I want to talk about government attitudes to, to, to parenting and to families. I mean, all governments say they want to help parents, and, and all, I believe, mean it. But there are different ways of doing that, and some work and some don't. What doesn't work, no matter how well-intentioned, is when governments try to fit parents and families around policy, packaging out prescriptive uniforms, uniform support and advice from the centre, cookie-cutter solutions which fail to recognise that families which look the same on paper can have wildly different needs. What does work is policy designed around parents, around changing work patterns, around evolving roles, around the economic crisis and the pressures it creates, supporting parents, empowering them. And if we in government can get that right, we don't just help individual families, we help our society as a whole. As the Home Front report explains, good parenting is absolutely central to social mobility. A child's future isn't determined only by their home life, but it can make all the difference. So if our shared social mission is to create a truly open Britain in which every child can get ahead, and it is, parents must be at the heart of that. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. First, I'll say a bit more about the link between parenting and social mobility. Then I want to address how government should respond to that how we should help parents make the right decisions for themselves instead of forever telling them what to do. And finally, I want to spell out some of the specific steps the coalition government is taking to do that. Looking on the one hand at the, at the way we're refocusing our efforts in these straightened times to help parents who need it most. And also what we're doing to help the majority of parents, giving them much more opportunity to balance work and home. And on that, I want to pay particular attention to flexible working and shared parental leave. Early on, this um, coalition government made clear that our primary social policy objective is to improve social mobility, in particular intergenerational social mobility. Now that's a much more complex concept of fairness than has been prevalent in policy making in recent years. According to the somewhat narrower model used by the previous government, greater fairness is measure measured by snapshot in comparisons of income alone. Income at any one point in time is, of course, hugely important. But it doesn't tell you everything about a person's life chances or the life chances of their children, about the ability people have to get ahead. And you simply cannot overestimate the role that parents play in that. As Demos's report notes, the ability of children to get ahead increasingly depends not just on academic brilliance or good fortune, but on self-discipline, motivation, self-confidence, qualities you begin to learn when you're very young. And as Frank Field has pointed out in his recent report, in the early years, parenting can have just as great an impact on a child's life chances as income or class, sometimes even greater. According to some research, just the simple fact of a mother or father being interested in their child's education can alone increase that child's chances of moving out of poverty by 25%. The truth is, when you have a child, you hold their fortunes in your hands. If you read to them, if you play with them, if you give them your attention, they will do better in life. 
and bad parenting does the reverse. And so the question for government is this. What can we do to help parents improve their children's life chances? There's no easy answer, obviously. The issue of how the state should be involved in something as private as raising a child has divided politicians for years. But while I accept that it's a difficult line to tread, I don't believe the previous government quite got the balance right. I don't doubt that Labour wanted to help parents, but their approach was too prescriptive, too controlling, too indiscriminate. Whether it was by denying parents meaningful control over their children's education, dictating even the most minute aspect of school's policy from the centre, or criminalising and vilifying troubled young people and tarnishing their families with the same brush, or building a welfare system that actively encouraged dependency, a system that almost preferred to keep parents reliant on the state rather than in charge of their families' fates. Labour nannied parents, because ultimately... They believed that the state had all the answers, that educating children, making people healthier, making the streets safer, moving families up the income scale, all had to be engineered from the centre. I think that came from a, a certain pessimism about the capacity of individuals and communities to improve their own lives. Convinced that social progress has to be driven by Whitehall, certain that every problem has a single technocratic solution. The coalition government takes a different view, a liberal view. Liberals start from an optimism about people and a realism about the state's limitations. We don't expect to know better than you how to raise and love your children. That doesn't mean that the nation's parents are now on their own. This isn't sink or swim government. But what it does mean is that we don't want to make your decisions for you. We want to make your choices possible. Parents have had enough of the wagging finger. They want a helping hand. Of course, this government is not indifferent to the choices parents make. We're not casual about the pressure that many parents feel, and I'll come on to how we're helping the, relieve some of those pressures. Nor will we be apathetic when parents' actions are clearly harmful to their children. There are a small minority of families in which parents fail to nurture and provide for their children, where they do not take proper responsibility. We don't think that's right and we don't expect the rest of our society to pick up the pieces. So although we won't tell you how to be a parent, we do expect you to be a parent. But our working assumption is this. Most parents, most of the time, are trying to do the right thing by their children, and we are on their side. How do we do that? In these straitened times, with resources as stretched as they are, our priority has to be parents who need the most help, parents in the most disadvantaged households. Financial hardship, the stress and conflict it causes, as this report has confirmed, can be hugely disruptive for families. And worklessness is a pattern that repeats itself across generations. If you grow up in a home where your parents don't work, you are much more likely not to work yourself. For boys, if your father was regularly out of work during your childhood, you are more than twice as likely to end up in the same situation. You're less likely to learn the value of work, less likely to get good grades, more likely to get into trouble. In the United Kingdom, there, now, there are now almost two million children growing up in workless households, one of the worst rates in Europe. We have to help their parents into work. Not because every home must have two working parents in it. If mothers or fathers can afford to stay at home and want to, then of course that's their choice. But work can help people become better parents. And not simply because of the money, but because it can help you become a better role model. It brings fulfilment. It fosters self-confidence. And it introduces parents to other working parents, people to learn from and talk to. So we're transforming the welfare system to give more out-of-work parents these opportunities. Crucially, our new simplified universal credit, which brings together an array of other benefits, will remove the perverse disincentives that can make the move into work so precarious for some of our poorest parents. Under the current system, just a modestly paid job can result in a loss of £9 out of every £10 extra earned. And on the issue of making work pay, we're also increasing the income tax personal allowance over the course of this parliament. As of this coming April, 
880,000 people will no longer pay income tax at all, and 23 million basic rate taxpayers will be up to £200 better off a year. Of course, work alone does not make for wonderful parents. Mothers and fathers need other forms of support. So in spite of the cuts that are now necessary to pay off the deficit, we are finding ways to provide that support. At the budget, the Chancellor increased the child element of the child tax credit by £180 in 2011-2012 and £110 in 2012-2013, more than the level promised by the last government. And during the spending review, we took the decision to protect free nursery education, 15 hours a week for all three- and four-year-olds. Ask any parent and they will tell you how important childcare is. And what's more, we've decided to extend that entitlement to two-year-olds from the most disadvantaged households. Supporting these early years is absolutely crucial. For so many children, the opportunities that await them have, to some extent, already been decided by the time they reach the school gates. Equally, parents need other kinds of help. They need to be confident their children are getting the right support in the classroom. And that's what our pupil premium is all about. By the end of this Parliament, we'll be spending two and a half billion pounds a year of additional money targeted at the most disadvantaged children in school. Money that will allow teachers to vote to devote more time to children who are falling behind. Something we know is good for the whole of the class. And we're retaining sure start centres. As the Demos report suggests, keeping them accessible to all but at the same time using Sure Start to deliver proven early intervention programmes for families in the greatest need. We're bringing in an extra 4,200 health visitors, increasing the number working with families by almost 50%. And on top of that, because we recognise that relationships between parents are so important to their children's well-being, we're providing funding for continued relationship support. These kinds of investments can make the world of difference especially for parents under financial pressure. No magic wand solutions, no preaching, just some help because we understand the pressures you are under. Finding a job, giving your child a, a good education, making a relationship work. We will do whatever we can to make those things easier. And the rest, the decisions, the choices, the lifestyle, well, that's up to you. The other way we can really help is by helping parents better balance work and home. That is something all working parents struggle with. Right now, most simply do not have the flexibility they need. Despite the fact fathers can request flexible working, many feel reluctant to do so. There is still a, a kind of stigma attached. And when a child is born, men are still only entitled to a paltry two weeks of paternity leave. These rules patronise women and marginalise men. They're based on a view of life in which mothers stay at home and fathers are the only breadwinners. It's an Edwardian system that has no place in 20th, 21st century Britain. Women suffer. Mothers are expected to take on the vast bulk of childcare themselves. If they don't, they very often feel judged. If they do, they worry about being penalised at work. So it's no surprise that many working women feel that they just can't win. Children suffer, too often missing out on time with their fathers, time that is desperately important to their development. We know that where fathers are involved in their children's lives, they develop better relationships, better friendships, they learn to empathise, they have higher self-esteem and they achieve better at school. And men suffer too. More and more fathers want to play a hands-on role with their young children, but too many feel that they simply can't. That culture must change. Government won't be able to change it alone, but we can do our bit by modernising the opportunities for parents who work. So the coalition agreement commits us to a universal right to request flexible working. Extending flexible working beyond mothers and fathers is essential if we're to dispel the stigma many men and some employers still attach to it. By extending flexible leave, for example, to grandparents or close family friends, we hope to make it much more common, a cultural norm. We will be saying more about this in detail shortly. 
And we hear loud and clear the message in today's report that any reform must be active rather than just passive, designed in such a way that encourages people to use it. What I can confirm today, however, is that plans are now well underway to overhaul the United Kingdom's arrangements for shared parental leave. As of this April, we will be implementing the changes agreed by the last government. Under these new arrangements, if a mother returns to work before the end of her maternity leave, the father will be able to take the remaining time up to a maximum of six months. And on that, I would like to genuinely pay tribute to Harriet Harman, who pushed through those changes despite considerable resistance she came up against in the last government. But we now want to go even further. We know that men need to be actively encouraged to take time off. And often parents want more flexibility than these arrangements will allow. So in the coming weeks, we'll be launching a consultation on a new properly flexible system of shared parental leave that we aim to introduce in 2015. I would have liked it to be sooner, but getting this right will take time. The options we're working through will have massive consequences for parents up and down the country, and they have to be considered carefully. It would be wholly irresponsible to rush these changes. And of course, at a time of continued economic uncertainty, we can't just spring any changes on employers. We need to work with business to make absolutely sure that from their point of view, the new system is sustainable and affordable. And that ultimately, it leaves British companies benefiting from a happier, more productive workforce. We want to create an environment that encourages parents and their employers to discuss leave plans openly and constructively. And we want to help businesses keep the staff that they've invested in. But I want to make clear that these reforms are a priority of mine and of the Prime Minister's. We don't have a final fixed view on the precise details of the new system, but we do know the principles we want it to embody. One, any new arrangement must absolutely maintain women's guaranteed right to time off in the first months after birth, paid as it is now, and we must protect the rights of lone mothers. Two, the reforms must transform the opportunities for fathers to take time off to care for their children. Three, it must be possible for mothers and fathers to share part of their leave, spitting it between them in whatever way suits them best. And four, the new system must take into account the needs of employers and it must be simple to administer. There are a number of ideas on the table. For example, we're looking at how we can keep mothers' existing rights following the birth, as well as fathers' existing two-week entitlement, but then beyond that, share the overall allowance between parents, pay as well as leave, and share it in a whole range of ways. So both parents could, say, be off at the same time if that's what they wanted to be, and leave could, in agreement with employers, be taken in a number of chunks rather than a single block. And crucially, we're also looking at what can be done to encourage men to take more leave. Possibly, for example, through use it or lose it blocks of time, especially <coughs> reserved for fathers. International evidence shows how important these can be in increasing take up amongst men. And, well, in an ideal world, any use it or lose it leave for dads would be in addition to the current total allowance for parents. But that, of course, costs money and could prove unaffordable. And clearly any changes need to reflect the difficult economic circumstances we find ourselves in. But it's right that we look at this option as we work through the consultation. It's also vital that these reforms aren't just for rich and affluent families. As we work out the new arrangements, we want to do everything we can to make sure they will be taken up by the thousands of parents in what I call alarm clock Britain. Parents who work hard, who pay their bills, who try to stay out of debt. People who aren't well off enough to feel completely secure, but earn enough not to have to rely on the state. People who want the best for their families, who want both mothers and fathers to be involved in bringing up their children. Too many of these parents feel trapped by the current rigid rules. We want to give them the flexib flexibility that finally sets them free. So, to sum up, let me once again thank Demos for a really, really important piece of work. It's not an easy area for government, but the coalition government will seek to get the balance right. 
supporting and empowering parents, particularly those most in need, and particularly in these difficult times, and helping all parents better balance work and home. We're very, very clear. The society we want to create, where every child can do well, will only ever be a pipe dream unless we work with parents to get there. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you.